Our passage for this evening is Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read together the first seven verses. Paul writes, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Amen. In the closing verses of chapter 1, that is the section verse 24 through to 29, Paul outlined the ministry that God had called him into. God had appointed him a servant of the gospel and a servant of the church. He had been given the task of presenting the word of God in its fullness, and this meant revealing the mystery of Christ indwelling his people as the hope of glory, Gentile believers included. And Paul's commitment to this ministry involved him in many struggles and brought much suffering, but in it all, he knew the empowering presence of Christ. Now, in these early verses in chapter 2, Paul makes the connection between his ministry in general and for the Colossians in particular. And he informs them both of his, his commitment to them and his concern for them. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider this section in two parts. First, we'll look at verses 1 to 5, in which Paul informs the Colossians of three things. He tells them why he is struggling for them. That's verses 1 to 3. Why he is warning them, verse 4. And why he delights in them, verse 5. When we've thought that through, we'll consider the hinge verses in the letter, verses 6 and 7. Paul's entire message to the Colossians is compressed into those two verses. If you want to understand Paul's letter to the Colossians, you would be well advised to mark and to memorize those two verses. So we'll begin then with Paul's struggles for the Colossians, and that's verses 1 to 3. And, and maybe the first thing worth saying would be that the chapter division here isn't the most helpful. The first verse of chapter 2 is clearly connected to the last verse of chapter 1. Paul has just mentioned the toil and the struggles that accompanied his ministry. And now in chapter 2, verse 1, he tells us that those struggles were also on behalf of the Colossians, their Laodicean neighbors, and indeed all those whom he had not personally met. And what we see here is just the extent of Paul's sacrificial commitment that the Gentiles might be brought to know Christ through the gospel. And let me remind you that we get our English word agony from the word Paul uses 
to describe his struggles both in chapter 1, verse 29, and in chapter 2, verse 1. Paul's ministry was a costly ministry, as indeed all true ministries for God will be. But what specifically was Paul struggling for? Well, he has already told us in chapter 1, verse 28, that the ultimate purpose of his ministry was that he might present each believer perfect or fully mature in Christ. And now, in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul tells us what that will look like in the lives of the Colossians. I should say, it's not necessarily the easiest sentence to follow. There are some difficulties of translation, but the objective, the, the outcome that Paul was striving to secure in the Colossian believers is obvious enough. I really like the ESV translation of these verses, and it irons out some of the bumps. So I want to read that to you. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." This is what Paul was striving for in his ministry for the Colossians and for all believers, whether he had met them or not. He wanted to see all of them strengthened, fortified in heart, and united, knit together, compacted in love. He wanted to see strong believers united together in love. But the nature of this unity must be understood. It is a unity in which believers are understanding more and more of the mystery of God, which is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is a Christ-centered, Christ-sponsored, unit, loving unity. Paul's passion and commitment was to see believers strengthened and pressed together in loving community as they advance together in their appreciation of the treasures of truth that are found in Jesus Christ and are found in Him alone. This cannot be overemphasized. The unity and togetherness of the saints, which Paul gave himself for, was one that was rooted in a shared conviction of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. In Christ alone are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all that God wants us to know and all that we need to know. Divine revelation, ultimate truth, resides exclusively in Jesus Christ. If there is not agreement on that, then there can be no true Christian fellowship and unity. True Christian love, togetherness, and unity only exists where Jesus is acknowledged as uniquely supreme and utterly sufficient. This is non-negotiable. No accommodation can be made. 
No compromise can be reached. So verses 1 to 3 help us understand why Paul struggled for the Colossians and for all those he never met face to face. He gave himself to the ministry that he might see strong, loving, united communities of believers delighting together in their glorious riches in Christ. And even today, 2,000 years later, we continue to benefit from this, this ministry. Just think how impoverished we would be in our understanding of the riches of salvation without Paul's ministry. How we should thank God for Paul's sacrificial service. But I think we should all face the challenge of these verses. Am I prepared to spend myself so that others might discover the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are found in Christ? Can there be any higher purpose for which to live than that? Could one of the reasons why so many around us feel little attraction to Christ be that we ourselves have failed to pursue and thus be captivated by the treasures that are found in knowing Christ? Are we being so filled up with the wonder of knowing God in Christ that others are being exposed to the overflow? Is there any greater need today than for little companies of believers for whom salvation simply sparkles and for whom Jesus Christ is their greatest treasure? Paul's struggles for the Colossians. Verse 4, Paul's warning to the Colossians. I tell you this, what? That he's striving, that, that you might grasp the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are found in Christ. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you with fine-sounding arguments or with persuasive or plausible speech. This is the first place in the letter where Paul refers explicitly to the threat presented by false teachers at Colossae. There is, you see, a, a very straightforward conclusion to be reached if all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden, are deposited in Christ alone. It's this. Every claim to the contrary is false. And every alternative path to enlightenment and truth is a dead end. There is no in-between. Epaphras has informed Paul that there was a new teaching in town which sought to gain a foothold in the Colossian church. And Paul does not underestimate its seductive appeal. There was a persuasiveness and a plausibility about it. As you read on in chapter 2, you discover that the false teaching had an appearance of wisdom. Verse 23. It came clothed in a false humility. Verse 18 and verse 23. That's repeated. It traded in speculation about the spiritual realm and boasted in private spiritual experiences 
that could be had. Chapter 2, verse 18. It offered pathways to higher knowledge through the observance of rights and a rigid regime of rules. Verse 16, verse 20, verse 23. It is well said that there is nothing new under the sun. This particular Colossian heresy has long since gone, but its countless reinventions and reincarnations are with us still. And make no mistake, our so-called secular society is awash with such spiritual speculation and experimentation. Listen, my dear fellow believers, there is nothing outside of Christ that we need. There is nothing beyond Christ that will add value to our relationship with God. Be on your guard against those offers of greater wisdom or peace or power or joy that can be found anywhere else, anywhere other than in Christ. No matter how persuasively it is presented or by whom it is endorsed. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms in Christ. Ephesians 1.3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Second Peter 1 and 3. Mark those two phrases, believer. All spiritual blessings. Everything we need. And remember this. As believers, we must always assess all teaching by the truthfulness of its content and not the attractiveness of its packaging. Paul says, don't be duped. What a word of warning for our internet age, our YouTube generation, where poisonous teaching is only ever a click away. We must not be deceived by Satan's schemes to draw us away from the sufficiency of Christ for our every need. Paul warned the Colossians of the real dangers that surrounded them, and we would do well to hear and to heed his warning today. Paul's struggles for the Colossians, his warning to the Colossians. Verse 5, Paul's delight in the Colossians. And this verse allows us to see the actual state of the Colossian church at the time of writing. Although they faced a clear and present danger, the Colossians were responding well to the challenge. They held their, their ground and they were firm in their faith. We should understand Paul's letter more as a vaccine against heresy rather than as an antibiotic given to those who have been infected. Paul assures them that even though he is physically separated from them, he is spiritually present with them, and he rejoices to see their firm stance and unbroken ranks. 
It's interesting to note that both the words Paul uses to describe the Colossians' orderliness and firmness in faith, both words were used in military contexts. And in actual fact, it is a, it's a, a feature of Paul's prison epistles, his letters written from prison to churches, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, that Paul actually makes repeated use of military metaphors and illustrations. And that should tell us something. For Paul, the Christian life is to be understood as a battleground and not as a playground. As he surveyed the battle scene at Colossae, he delighted in the state of the troops who had locked together to defend and hold the line for the truth of the gospel. And nothing less is required from us today where false teaching abounds and where many are sucked in by its false promises. Paul struggles for the Colossians so that they might grasp what they have in Christ. He warns them of the real dangers presented by those who would seek to draw them away from Christ. And he rejoices in knowing that his Colossian brothers and sisters are presenting a united front in their faithful stand for Christ and the gospel. Now, the second part of our study relates to those all-important hinge verses in verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. This is Paul's distilled message for the Colossians, and it is a call to continuance. The key words upon which those verses turn are, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him rooted, etc., this is Paul's first command in the letter. And a string of further commands are going to follow between chapter 2, verse 6, and chapter 4, verse 6. But this single command sets the context for all the others. It establishes the only legitimate direction open to the Colossians. And it lights up the only road to true spiritual progress. So what is that singular direction and path? It's this. Continue as you have begun. Just as you entrusted yourself completely to Christ to meet all your spiritual needs at your conversion, so continue to trust Him. Just as you look to Christ alone on day one, so continue to look to Him for the rest of your life. True spiritual progress will only be made on precisely the same terms and conditions as the day you were saved. And what were they? Absolute surrender before Christ as Lord and all your faith placed in Him. I often say it, and particularly so when talking with new converts, Christian living is challenging, but it isn't complicated. Complicated. 
At your conversion, you entered the Lordship of Christ. The only way to go forward is to remain there. Paul is instructing the Colossians to stay true to their roots. Quite literally, that's what he's saying. It's concealed in the English, but rooted in verse 7 is actually a perfect tense, which is a form of the past tense. The Colossians were already rooted in Christ and then were to continue to be built up in Him, to become strong and established in the faith and to overflow with thankfulness. All their growth and development will occur as they continue to live within the sphere of the Lordship of Christ. There is zero growth for the Christian outside of the Lordship of Christ. For Paul, believing and behaving are inseparable. To say Jesus is Lord means living with Jesus as Lord. No wedge can be driven between those two things. What would Paul make of the teaching popular with some? That at conversion, we receive Christ as Savior, and then, hopefully, sometime later, we acknowledge Him as Lord. Paul tells us the Colossians received Christ Jesus as Lord. Two final observations. First, you'll notice that Paul stresses again the continuity between what the Colossians had already heard and what they must continue in. Paul issues his apostolic stamp of approval on the ministry of Epaphras in verse 7. He tells the Colossians they were to be strengthened in the faith that they had been taught. Remember, Paul was never there. No new or novel teaching was required or permitted. Epaphras had pointed the Colossians to Christ alone. He was sufficient for all their needs, and it was in that faith that they were to continue. Second, you'll notice that Paul stresses again the place of thanksgiving in the lives of properly developing Christians. Overflowing with thankfulness. It's a throwback to chapter 1, verse 12, to Paul's prayer report, how he prayed for them, that they would be joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and rescued us and brought us into the kingdom. Thankfulness to God for all that we have in Christ is not only appropriate in itself, it's also an important offensive weapon against false teaching. The counterfeits of the devil fail to fool grounded, growing, and grateful believers. Take time in your Christian experience to consider all, to bask in all that you have in Christ, for in so doing, you will erect impregnable gospel defenses around your spiritual life. Thankfulness is a weapon in the Christian's arsenal. So where does Colossians 2 verses 1 to 7 find us in our walk with Christ? 
More importantly, where will we allow it to take us? Is it our desire to pursue together the treasure, the treasures that are ours in Christ? Will we make it our life's ambition to explore for ourselves and to explain to others what it is to know Christ? Are we, us here in Castlereagh Fellowship, are we prepared to move forward together in the Lordship of Christ and become growing, strong, and thankful believers? Will God himself delight to see us standing strong with unbroken ranks in our loyalty to Christ and to his gospel? I can think of no better outcome than that. Can you?